invited Floyd to come up here to speak. Uh, I had, I've never heard us heard us talk, but uh, probably about thirty or forty people approached me about his lead, and uh, and said that he would be a wonderful speaker for the for the conference, and and so uh, uh, we made arrangements and and we met at um, I, I met him one other time at, at up at another meeting and and. Uh, and just his his body language and his personality just uh, confirmed the fact that, I, that that he was a good speaker for up here. And then uh, we met him at uh, Cracker Barrel for breakfast, and uh, and we had a real nice breakfast. And uh, and I'm real really uh, really want to hear his story, so I'm going to give you Floyd from Pittsburgh, Floyd. Uh, my name's Floyd. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm from Cannonsburg. That's south of Pittsburgh. Perry Como territory. That's where Perry Como and a few other celebrities are from. I say I'm an alcoholic, and I didn't know what that, I, I didn't even know what that was. When they mentioned AA, I heard it over the years, AA. I thought it was the Automobile Association. I didn't know what that, it had anything to do with drunks. You know, it really makes me feel comfortable, but I look out over you, you don't look like a bunch of alcoholics. Or Al-Anons, because you got your own look, too, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I just want to get right to, right, right to the, the miracle, and that's what I call this, is a miracle. Uh, I was born in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, and uh, I was one of ten kids. There were seven boys, three girls. Both parents are alcoholics, both of them, hard cores. I never remember my mother drawn a sober breath in her life. She never washed a stitch of clothes, never cooked a meal, never cleaned the house. My mother would wake up, sit up, and drink up in that order every day as long as I can remember. Dad would go to work and leave a bottle of Four Roses whiskey on the chair next to the bed with two dollars underneath it every morning. I wonder why he did that. But I found out years later that she would get up and sit on the edge of bed and, and turn that bottle up, take that two dollars, stick it in here, give us our orders. The girls were to clean the house. The boys had a lot of jobs to do around the house. We lived in the ghetto area of our community, the other side of the tracks, and it was dirty and poor, and we didn't have a lot because... You know, we had 10 kids, and then supporting two habits, there was nothing that... We ate a lot of oatmeal. we go to school with butter sandwiches with sprinkled with sugar. That was a big thing, and that's what we took to lunch for school. I remember one time, my sister had a pair of these black uh, patent leather shoes that had a little strap that went over them. Well, I didn't have no shoes. And so I cut that strap off, and I put them on, and I tried to pass them off as loafers. <laughs> I was in three fights that day, <laughs> because it didn't, it didn't fly. It just didn't fly. So needless to say, I would come home. My father was a violent drunk. He, he'd get drunk. And then how he ever get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, went out that door to work, I'll never know. But he did it every morning. It either was because... He knew he needed it to get his habits applied or because of us kids. I didn't think he cared about us. But he must have cared somewhat because he was out that door every morning at 7 o'clock working, six days a week. How he did that, I don't know, because he came in at 2 o'clock in the morning drunk, raging bull. I never understood that, how he could do that. Well, I spent a lot of time running the streets because I didn't want to be at home. I didn't like it there. So I ran out in the streets with guys who were like me. Smoking cigarettes, drinking wine. We used to get the local drunk to buy us a bottle of wine. Go down by the ball field and drink it and get funny. And uh, the cops would go to my father and say, you better do something about that boy. He's going to get himself. He says, he'll outgrow it. Leave him alone. Pop didn't care. I spent a lot of time away from home. I wouldn't come home. And I'm, I'm 12, 13 years old. I wouldn't come home until 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm out running the streets with these other guys. And we're getting in trouble, and we're doing this, and we're doing. We're going to. We go into the the local five and ten, or to the uh, drugstore, and reach over the glass thing and get cigarettes and stealing them, and and, and stealing comic books, Captain Marvel, you know, 
stuff like that, anything. And we got a reputation. Mothers would tell their boys, don't run with them Ridley boys. They're a bad crew. It wasn't my brothers and sisters. They all were cool. It was me. My brothers and sisters were afraid of my father. That's why they never got out of hand. I didn't care. Even then, I didn't care. My dad had beat me because he'd be beating our mom, and I'd get between them, and he'd start whipping on me. But my thinking was, he's not hitting her no more. And that's the way I looked at it. And uh, so I started getting in a lot of trouble. When I was 14 years old, I robbed a guy's house. And uh, I got caught, and I went to court, and I got put on probation. But they took me out of my father and mother's custody, and they put me with my sister who was married and had six kids of her own. But she lived up in the Pocono Mountains. I mean, out of town. And all I had to get in trouble up there with was bears, raccoons, and squirrels. <laughs> there, there was no place to run up there. So for the next two years, I was in her custody, and I went to school. I didn't do nothing. I just sat there. I wouldn't do the work. I kept failing. They kept keeping me back. When my brother caught up to me in seventh grade, it was time for me to leave. I told my sister, and at that time, if you were 16 years old, I'm 16 years old in the seventh grade. <laughs> That's a trip. <laughs> my sister signed me out because she needed help with those six kids anyway and, and, and the place up where I live. So I left school because my brother, my younger brother, caught up to me, and I, that was embarrassing right there. So I left. And I stayed okay for two years when I was with her. And then after the probation was up, I went back to town, and I kept doing what I always did, getting in trouble. Well, I got caught again for another robbery charge. I had light fingers, I guess, or something. But I always needed money in my pocket to impress you. I thought I could buy my friends that way. That's why I always had to have money. I got caught this time, and the judge says, you do one of two things, Floyd. You either go in the military or you're going to jail. Well, I signed a dotted line for the Marine Corps, and I went there, and I was a good Marine. I did good while I was there. I went in 1962, and the Vietnam War was starting to escalate. A lot of boys were starting to go there now. I figured that's my next stop was Vietnam. And I had a drinking habit I had developed already, running with those street guys. And I didn't even know it. I was alcoholic already because I... When I didn't have it, I went looking for it all the time. I went looking for it. I needed it, more or less. I didn't know I needed it. I just know I wanted it. So I came home on, on furlough from the service, and the government, the military, was only giving me $76 a month. I can't drink on $76 a month. <laughs> That's one night. You know, I'm just being the big shot I am. I got to blow that money and. And I couldn't, I couldn't support my habit on $76 a month as an E1. But I come home on furlough one weekend, and I'm talking to my buddies in the bar, guys I grew up with, and they're on a robbing rampage. They're going around robbing places, and they always had a pocket full of money. So what I became was a weekend robber. <laughs> I get furlough from the Marine Corps, I come home and go with these guys and rob places. And they go back to the base on Sunday night, 10 o'clock. I had a pocket full of money. I was the cock of the walk. <laughs> Man, I had a pocket full of money. Big shot. Well, you can't do that behavior very long without getting caught. And the cops got me, threw me in jail. Well, it wasn't a couple of days later. Here come the shore patrol. I think, well, they'll get me out of this. <laughs> no. <laughs> they had hand delivered my discharge to me. He says, the Marine Corps has no further use of your services. <laughs> I handed my discharge. <laughs> well, I had 15 counts of robbery in three states. I lived on the border of New York and Pennsylvania. You went six miles north, you were in New York State. You went a mile east, you was in Jersey. The Delaware River snaked through there, and that's what separated the three states. Well, I was in each, I was robbing the states I didn't even know I was in. I didn't know I was in Jersey. The money was the same. <laughs> So I go, New York won the first shot at me, so I go to court in New York, and because of my bad uh, juvenile record, they gave me six years at Western Penitentiary in Pittsburgh. They did not play with me. So you do six years, you don't get parole. And I had detainers from New Jersey and New York. They wanted my butt next. 
I did the whole six years. Well, here I am now. Get adrift of this. I'm 19 years old now. I'm going to the Western Penitentiary in Pittsburgh. It's a bad place. And I'm cute. Get my drift? I'm cute. 19-year-old boys in the penitentiary get a problem. And I knew this going in. I said, they're going to try to do something to me, and I'm going to kill somebody, and this is where I die. Because I'm going to die here, because they ain't going to be doing that to me. So I, they put me in the prison van to take me to the Western, and I heard them guys talking that Kennedy just got shot in Dallas, Texas. It was November 22, 1963, was when I got shipped to the joint. I went there, and they put you 30 days in quarantine before they throw you to the dogs out in population. I mean, the thing that saved my life, there were two guys doing time at the Western at the time I knew from the streets, and they were gorillas. Saved my life. They passed word down to quarantine. Tell, tell Floyd when he comes out in population, he had no problem. He'll run with us. And I did. I had no problem. Nobody messed with these guys. What I learned to do was I learned to make Raisin Jack, and I was taking... Old, the roll on deodorant, we'd squeeze that out, and it was alcohol. And we were sniffing thinner through a rag, paint thinner, get you high, anything to get loaded. Because I didn't like where I was, who would? And I didn't like what I had became, and I didn't like what I saw when I looked in the mirror. So I tried to alter that. And we take chemicals into our system. I don't care if you shoot it, drink it, pop it, take it as a suppository. If you're taking that stuff in your system to change who you are, that's addiction. I was strung out and didn't even know it. I say loaded the whole six years. But I did finish high school. Woo, got a GED. And I was a, what they call a stand-up con. I was all right. Well, I think, I mean, six years is up in 1969. I go to go walk out. They're giving me a suit. I think, I'm forgetting. This duty dangerous on me. I walk out the front gate and they're standing in New Jersey. Hello. <laughs> I said, oh, God, I forgot about you guys. Two U.S. Marshals. They take me down to Jersey, try me, give me seven and a half to 15 years. Right off the bat. Seven and a half, 15 years in Trenton. I go, oh, my God. My knees buckled. I says, I can't do no more time. I just finished doing six. But the judge of the Western wrote that judge a letter, the, the warden, and said that he recommended leniency because I wasn't a bad guy. I could have told him that. <laughs> so he suspended the sentence, and he says, on the grounds you'll never step foot in the state of New Jersey again. I said, Your Honor, I won't fly over your state. And I meant it. I won't fly over your state. I left, and New York picked me up. Now, they, they made a deal with me. New York said, well, we get you for five counts. If you make restitution, we'll drop the charges. We won't prosecute you. Well, I had all this money that I had robbed. I had stashed it in the Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City. I had that money sitting there. It was a lot of money. I said, you mean if I give you the money back? I don't have to do no more time. He said, that's it. I gave him the key. He said, there's the key to the safe spot. And I never did no more time. Now, here I am. had 15 counts, three states, and I did six years. I'm a pretty lucky man. I should still be in there. But God in his mercy even then had mercy on this drunk. Here I am, 26 years old, and I got a suit that the joint gave me and $40 in my pocket. And I don't know nothing. I said, what am I going to do? My brother, my older brother, went to the Naval Academy, graduated, was a Naval pilot for a while. His eyes went bad. They grounded him. He got out. He went to law school. All my other brothers and sisters turned out well. My girls, all the girls married professional men. I got two brothers who became top chefs. The other one's a hospital administrator. All the, and everybody, and then there was Floyd. This wild <laughs> renegade. This crazy man. You know, it just went, something happened there. That night my dad and mom made love or something. Something happened. You know, something went way haywire. Must have been Halloween night or something. I don't know. But I know I was a basket case, and I didn't know it. But I knew my brother, Art, he liked me. 
You know, I was in lockup. He, he'd write me a letter now and then. <laughs> Tell me I was doing, hope I was doing. I'd send me a few bucks for cigarettes. So I go back home. And home's the last place I should be because they, they remember me. They don't want no parts of this guy. And my brother knew this. Now, he's starting a law firm in, in this town. I go there. And he says, Artie, I, I need to get a break in line. I need to start. I don't know what to do. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll help you get started. He gave me $1,000 and told me to find a life, but not here. <laughs> <laughs> Go someplace else. You know, we didn't want you here. So I left, and I'm only 86 miles from New York City, so I go into New York City thinking, well, I'll make my fortune here. Here I am, 26 years old. I got one suit, and I got $1,000 at 40. 1040 the 40 bucks I got. <laughs> and I went to New York because I'm going to make a killing now. I'm going to be a wheeler and dealer. I go there, and in a couple of months, that thousand was gone, and I'm laying homeless on the streets of New York, and I don't know which way to go, so and I found the Bowery, Skid Row. I stood in the corner of Bowery and Houston Street, and I looked down both sides of the street, and I saw the derelicts laying in the gutter, dying, women too. And I said, this is where I belong. My self-worth was underneath a rock somewhere. I... I fell in with these brothers and sisters, and I thought, oh, I need somebody to teach me. <clears throat> so I got a mentor, a teacher, Panhandle Pete. Forty years he's been on the road, and he became my mentor, my, my guru. And I sat under his teaching for the next two years, laying on Skid Row in New York City. He taught me every conceivable way there was to survive in that lifestyle, and I learned it well. And people were dying around me every day. And the meat wagon come through and throw the bodies in the trucks. And they take them to the morgue. And when they get six bodies, they put them in a, a, in a cardboard coffin. And they take six of them at a time out to Long Island. And they put one on top of the other. And they bury them. It was called Potter's Field. And they buried them. No marker, no nothing. And that was the end of that. Because they didn't have nobody. Now, I'm thinking, I'm sitting down there drinking my La Bohemia White Port. <laughs> It was chemical. It wasn't even fruit of the vine. <laughs> it was chemical. You shake that in the sunlight, man, you see the little things floating in there. <laughs> but I'm, I'm drinking this stuff, and it's doing for me what all the ice in the world can't. It makes me think I'm okay. And I'm thinking, I don't want to go to Potter's Field. I got to get out of here. So I go to my mentor, and he says, you're ready to go forth, Floyd. So he gave me my diploma. I graduated with honors. And I took off for the next 35 years. I became, you know, a hobo. I rode the rails. I learned how to do that. And I traveled coast to coast, down into Mexico, up through Canada. The only thing I knew how to do was how to ride a freight train, how to start a hobo camp, and how to live by my wits. And I did that for 35 years. I didn't care about nothing about where I was going to get my next drink and a cigarette. And I got famous in the hobo circle because I had good camps. People would be in Sweetsport, Louisiana, and say, I'm going up to, I'm going Texas way. What do we got going there? I said, Floyd's got a camp in Amarillo. Okay, good. Because I, I made good beans. I always had a pot of stew going. And when I stopped at my camp, a, a tramp knew he could get a cigarette, a drink, and a bowl of beans. He knew that. And I started a lot of camps across the nation, all over this country. And my camps became famous. Floyd's got a camp in Shreveport. Let's go down there and have some good beans. And they'd take a freight down there and have come for dinner. We'd sit around, we'd hobo camp and drink wine and, and eat beans, smoke cigarettes, and talk trash. Like, it don't get no better than this. <laughs> we didn't know how sick we were. Here we are, this stuff is killing us, and we didn't know it. We did not know it. We had no idea. Well, listen, you can't drink like that and live like that without your body telling you something. My body started shutting down. I'm in Colorado. I'm in a park drinking with a bunch of other winos, and I'm starting to get sick, and I'm throwing up, and I'm throwing up blood. So I get nervous, and they say, you know, we know a place up north that takes care of guys like us. It was called the detox. I never heard of these places. 
And, then, and these days, they were just starting to have them. Detoxes, treatment centers, things of this nature. So I, uh, I said, let's go. So we go on up there. You know what they did? They took me into this detox center, gave me a shower. I take one, a bath once a month if I needed it or not. At that time, I was like an aristocrat. I had a certain air about me. Now, I, I smell funny. You know, I didn't take baths, and I was dirty, and I had a beard down in my belt buckle and long hair and a bandana. You wouldn't have took me to a worm wrestle. <laughs> it looked bad, and I looked the part of a nasty old drunk. But they, you know what? They treated me with kindness. They put me in a bed. They gave me medicine so I wouldn't shake because I had it bad now. When I, I detox, I, I'd hallucinate, I'd seizure. And so they gave me medicine so that wouldn't happen to me. And then you're only there five days, and I'm eating three square meals a day. I was eating off a plate. You know what, it, what, what I remember about that first detox of mine? I'll tell you what I remember today at 60 some years old. I went in my room that night, the first night I was there. I sat in the bed, and I laid down that bed. And my body sunk down in that mattress. And my head went back into a soft pillow that was foreign territory for me. I used to concrete the bush, bridges. That's where my home was. And here they gave me a bed. And I pulled the sheets up, and, and they smelled good. I said, wow. You know, the thought that went through my head was that I must have did something right along the way to get this. And that might not mean nothing to nobody else, but for this drunk, that little thing meant the world to me at that point. Five days later, they told me you got to leave, and I'm still sick. And they said, Floyd, and they got a halfway house upstairs. You didn't have to go through treatment. You could go right from the detox right to the halfway house in them days. He said, if you can get a job, and I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> they, said, they said, a job. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get a job, right? <laughs> You're going to hire me. Anyway, I had a lot of work. <laughs> the only thing I did was I had on a little truck once in a while and get a few dollars for a bottle. If you get a job, you can stay up in the halfway house. But well, I needed some more healing time because my body was ripped. So I went in and got a job washing dishes at a greasy spoon. I think I made a buck and a quarter an hour. But it was enough so I could stay upstairs. I stayed upstairs. Now, there was a girl that worked there at night. She checked in all the new people coming in detox, Kathy. Well, see, what happened was when I sobered up, my body woke up. <laughs> And I looked and I went, wow. See, that part of my life was dead for years. But I woke up and I saw her up and I went, ooh, she's cutie. You know, long hair, pretty. And I started putting my intellectual moves on her, <laughs> you know. I'm going to tell you how sick this girl was. This girl was working in a recovery setting. This is how sick she was. In three months, she married me. I was there for three months. Working in that, rising in dishes. Man, I conned her and I sweet talked her. And three months later, she was going to save Floyd. She was going to take me away from all this. She took me and married me. And took me into her home with a car. And her dad was a Shriner. And he thought she was stark raving mad. <laughs> you lost your mind. <laughs> but she didn't know that once I got out of that halfway house and went home with her, I started drinking again. I got a couch to sit on a coffee table to put my wine on. <laughs> you know, I'm big shot now. Well, she put up that for a year because she thought she was really going to save me. She realized a year later that it wasn't going to happen. I was getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, she was pregnant. She said, Floyd, if you don't do something, I'm gone. And I didn't believe her, so I kept drinking, and she was gone. Well, when she was gone, I did what I always did. I packed the ditty bag and jumped the freight train. I'm back to the life I knew. I didn't need this anyway. They don't know who I am. I'm the Ripper. King of the Road. 
Boom, there I go. Three years more. I'm out in there in the road, running around the country like crazy, man. And I'm in San Bernardino, laying on Skid Row, like I always did. And there's a guy in AA coming down there every day in that alleyway with a pack of cigarettes and a thing of coffee. Try to talk to me about, do you want to get sober? I said, what, are you crazy? <laughs> Get away from me. <laughs> then I started being nice to him because he brought me that pack of cigarettes. I need them cigarettes. So I get a, a, a noble thought one day. I'm going to call my wife, my ex-wife, and find out what we had, a boy or a girl, because she was pregnant when I left. This is three years later. I call her, collect, of course, and said, we had a son. Would you like to see him? And I said, yeah, you can see him. You can come up to Denver. I'll meet you at the airport. I'm thinking, she thinks I'm going to fly. <laughs> I'm talking about a freight train, man. And you meet me in the yards. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking this. <laughs> you know, so she says, you come out up, you can see your son, as long as you're not drinking. I couldn't stop. So I, uh, the guy from AA sitting there, he gave me the money to make the phone call, his card. He says, Floyd, you need to go there and heal this relationship with your ex-wife and, and, and make some kind of amends to her and your baby. Three years old now. I said, all right. I said, I'll go down to Salvation Army and get a clean set of clothes and I'll jump a freight. And <laughs> you want it? No, 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 no. I'll buy you a plane ticket. This guy bought me a plane ticket to Denver. This guy from AA. Gave me a few dollars. He says, let me know how it goes. So I call her, tell her, I'm coming. By the time I'm flight and everything, I get off the plane. Here she's standing with a three-year-old red-headed boy. What do you say? What do you say? I'm thinking about this. There ain't nothing coming. I don't know what to say. What do I say to her? I'm sorry. So I wasn't there. A bing, a bang, a boom. What do you say? Oh, this slick Floyd didn't have nothing to say. And I stood there and looked at him, and I looked at her, and she put her arms around me and hugged me. And she had the audacity to look at me and say, do you want to try it again? Like she wanted me back. Can you believe that? This crazy, this girl has, I had to be sick. So what kind of drugs are you shooting? You know, that's what I thought. Well, I said, yeah, we can try this. Well, she took me home with her. <clears throat> I lasted three days. It didn't take her long this time. She saw that he didn't change. She says, I'm sorry, Floyd, it ain't going to work. But I left. Pack the bag, jump freight chain, gone. 20 more years I drank up until I got sober. They told me in, in a hospital out in the Midwest, I was so bad at this time, I weighed 98 pounds, I was dying. They rushed me to a hospital. The doctors came into the emergency room and said, Floyd, you're going to die in probably a month, you'll be dead. You got cirrhosis, you got pancreatitis, you got a growth the size of an orange by your bladder, your kidneys are shot, your lungs are ready to collapse, you, you just, <laughs> you're a mess. And you're going to die. Is there anything else, Doc? <laughs> that was my attitude. I did not care. I didn't care about nothing. Anything else? <laughs> no. I said, thank you. So I leave and go get a jug. And I'm sitting there, I remember having that bottle in my hand and what I said to myself. I said, let me figure this out now. Got all that going on with me. Let me figure this out. Oh, yeah, it's all getting clearer now. <laughs> I know what the problem is. It's you. This ain't me. They're crazy, man. I, ain't nothing wrong. I feel good, man. There ain't nothing wrong with me. <laughs> yeah, they can't kill me. But then that little twinkling thing in my head told me, if they're right, and I die some night by myself, they're going to put me in Potter's Field. God, I don't want to go there. So I call my brother the lawyer. <laughs> Collect. <laughs> Hi, Art. And I told my doctor sitting and everything, and he says, I'll tell you what I'll do, Floyd. You keep my phone number and address in your wallet. I didn't have a wallet. <laughs> but I said, all right, I'll keep it in my pocket. He said, when you die and they find a the body, they can call me. I'll see that you're buried. <laughs> and I'll see you get a little stone. 
I'll do that much for you. Have a good day. And I said, oh, I need some money. I thought I'd come up to see you. No, where are you? I'll send you some money. Just stay where you're at. I'll send you. So he sent me two, three hundred dollars, Western Union. Keep me away. He says, I'll bury you. I said, okay, now I'm going to be noble about this because I'm a nice guy, right? I don't want him to have to ship my body all the way across country, so I moved back to Pennsylvania. So he don't have to, no problem from Pittsburgh to the Pocono, ain't that far, so it'll make it easy on him to send the body. That's my thinking. I'm actually thinking like this. So I come to Pittsburgh, and I open up a condo underneath the 10th Street Bridge <laughs> on the south side. I moved in there, and for the next three years, that's where I lived. I lived underneath that bridge, and I would hustle the streets of Carson Street, and I would go down in the morning and help you ladies carry your groceries to your car from Giant Eagle, and they'd give me 50 cents or quarter. By the time the liquor store opened, I had $20. I had a maid. I go back with a half gallon of Mad Dog. I get nose bags from the butcher. And they didn't have butchers anymore, so that went out. That was the ends of the meat that the butcher used to cut. He put them in a bag and saved. We call it a nose bag because it was the nose of the meat. Go in there and give him 35 cents, he'd give you that bag of ends of the meat. And that's my diet. I'd take that back to the bridge, have my nose bag, a pack of cigarettes, a half gallon of Mad Dog, and it don't get no better. <laughs> I thought I was in cat heaven. I actually believed it. That's how sick the alcoholic mind was working. As long as I had that drink, that drink I could be anybody I wanted to be, and I could try to convince you I was okay. I started getting real sick. And I says, well, I don't want to die on this bridge. I'm watching the ice go down the river in the middle of the winter. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning, the cops would come under the bridge to check on me to see if I'm still alive. You all right, Floyd? You know, we can help you. And now I'm all right. I'm all right. They leave me alone. I didn't cause no trouble. So I think maybe if I move out of Pittsburgh, I need to get out of the big city. So I come up to Washington, PA. And I opened up a, a camp in the woods next to Coca-Cola. There's a wooded area. I needed running water, so there's a brook there. So I moved to camp there because I needed running water, of course, for my apartment. So I had a lean-to, and I had all what I need, my necessities. And then I went hustling in, in Main Street in Washington. You don't do that like you do in Pittsburgh. They frown upon that kind of behavior in a smaller town. It's like Pan Panhandle. Can you imagine me Panhandling here? <laughs> <laughs> I walked down the street and I said, boy, I'll tell you. They had me locked up before I got two blocks. <laughs> but I get, I get to Washington and, they keep, and the cops keep giving me tickets for public drunk. They don't lock you up. They give me tickets, $65. <laughs> oh, look at this. You would pay this. He says, yeah, you got 10 days. Yeah, you're right. Now I get four or five of these in a couple of days. And Judge, uh, uh, Chief Justice Spence, they, take, they pick me up one day and bring me before him. Well, Spence knew me from reputation. He said, well, this, he lives out under that, over in that wood area, in the woods there, in that lean-to. He says, yeah, that's him. Don't bring him in here. Get him out of here. Don't lock him up. I ain't going to feed him. We ain't going to house this drunk. Get him out of here. Don't pick him. Don't give him tickets. He ain't going to pay him. Just make sure he don't bother too many people. And if he gets too out of hand, then we'll lock him up. But he, I didn't bother nobody but just hustle you for a nickel, dime, buck here, whatever. I, I was nice about it. That's why people didn't complain because I had a charisma. <laughs> 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 so, and I had that way about me. But then I started getting real, and the sickness started getting worse and worse and worse. So I'm going down Main Street one day, and I wasn't that drunk yet. And I fell out. My body just refused to work anymore. They rushed me to Washington Hospital, and they said, Floyd, you got, we, there's a place in Cannonsburg. It's a personal care home, and they got a bed for you. You're going to die here in a little while because your body, everything's shutting down at once. So why don't you let us take us up there? The doctors at least can make it comfortable for you. And I said, okay. So they take me up to this personal care home in Cannonsburg. The government was picking up the tab. I don't know how they did that. They got the government to pay for it, which is pretty cool, because I didn't have no money. The government says, all right, we'll pay for, his, for you guys to work with him. They went through welfare somehow, and they got this all set up. 
Now, I'm in this personal care home, but I ain't stopping the drinking. I ain't doing that. I found out where the bars were, and they got one bar that opens up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and that was it, North Bain. And I'd walk there in the morning from Cannonsburg to get that drink. And I kept drinking. I kept hustling. And when I was able to, I'd paint something, because I was a painter. Once in a while in my life, I could paint. And I get a few dollars and I get drunk. And well, the people, the nurses at this personal care home called the owner and said, we can't, Floyd's drunk every night he comes in here. What are we going to do? We can't do this. The owner was about money. He said, huh? he's getting $1,000 a month from the government to keep me. He ain't throwing that out the window. He says, does Floyd cause any trouble when he comes in? No, leave him alone. He ain't going to be with us that much longer anyway. They said, okay. So they left me alone. I kept doing what I did. And I fell out one night there in the personal care home. They rushed me to the hospital, and they had to operate that night. They cut me. And I'm laying there in the recovery room at Cannonsburg Hospital, and a surgeon from Allegheny General walked through. He picked up my chart, looked at it, looked at me, and he told the doctor, surgeon, just transfer him to Allegheny General right now. So they sent me to Allegheny General, and for the next year, I had six operations. They removed the lung. They took so many feet of my intestines. They took that growth by my bladder away. They were giving me medicine for my cirrhosis and my pancreatitis. And I weighed 95 pounds, tops. And I'm laying here, and I got all these tubes stuck in me, and I got tubes stuck in here feeding me with, and tubes in my nose, and tubes in my butt. And I'm laying there, and they finished just finished taking a lung, and the doctor's telling a guy from AA, because you know what? The guys from AA were the only guys who would come to see me. And they were from Cannonsburg. They'd drive all the way to Pittsburgh and sit in my room and talk to me. And I didn't even hear him. You know, if you don't drink, Floyd, you don't get drunk. One of the awakening. No shit, Charlie Brown. You know, it don't have to be like this no more. But I was so cocky, so full of myself. I didn't want, these guys are crazy. Don't drink for 30 days. What, are you out of your mind? But the doctor's talking to this one guy who today is my sponsor, Jim, who's got over 30 years sober. He stuck with me. Ten years he, he messed with me. Even my ten, last ten years of my drinking, Jim tried to help me. I call him drunk. He came down to Washington to get me. And the streets, and I cuss him out in the middle of the street. He just got out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, come and get my butt, and I'm saying, there's a year for crap, that's over, I'm black, 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 and he'd go home. he tells tell his wife, he said, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> I'm going to kill that guy. His wife would look at him and say, pray for him. <laughs> oh, pray for him. He didn't want to hear that crap at this time. He wants to kill somebody. <laughs> Bless he's me. Doctor's telling him in that room, he says, does he have family? He says, yeah, but the Poconos. He says, you better contact him. I said, why? Because he ain't going to make it. We cut him too many times too close together, and he's not strong enough. He's, he's going to die. He ain't got the fortitude to fight back. I heard this. You know what? I don't care who you are or what you did or who you thought you were. Something like that, you can get humble real quick where the rubber meets the road. And I got scared for the first time, and I can't tell you when. I got scared because I said to myself, you know, if everything I ever heard about God is true, I'm in trouble. Because if I die, whoo, I thought this life was bad. This is just a kindergarten to where I'm going. And I got to really seriously thinking that way, laying in that hospital bed. The least I want to do is make sure your butt was covered before you check out. So I remember turning my head to the window, and I said, God, I can't get sober. And that still, small voice, not verbal, in your heart, speaks to you. It says, I know. Floyd, you're in my way. I heard that just as clear as you said it to me. I heard it. The obsession they talk about, about alcoholism, 
God, what he did that day, he took the obsession away. He said, Floyd, you do the footwork. You got to do this. I'm going to take the obsession, the gnawing that drives you to drink. I'm going to take it away. But you got to do the footwork. I spent another month in that hospital healing. Doctors were amazed because they figured he ain't going to last another a week. And they sent me back to that personal care home. Now I'm still all tubed up. And I had a visiting nurse coming in every day ministering to me. And ever so slightly, they took this tube out, this tube out, this tube out. And I started eating soup and crackers and stuff like that. And then they started solid food and eventually, you know, and then the matter of, and then when I was able to walk, they had to send me out to rehab a while because I couldn't walk because I was in bed too long. So they sent me over to Beverly and the nurses walk around like this and then I walked with a walker and then a cane and then I was able to walk. For a couple of months they kept me in that rehab and then took me back to Bristol Carroll. My guy became my sponsor. He used to come on Saturday night, him and his wife, carry me to the car, put me in the car, to an AA meeting. And I sit there just like we are tonight, listen to some guy tell his story, and I started listening. And something happened to Floyd, because the day I left the hospital, that was my last drink. That was my last cigarette. I quit both of them at the same time. I gave them to God. I started putting on a few pounds. I started being able to motivate better. And then I asked the doctor, can I try to paint a door? And he said, yeah. So I painted this and I painted that. And I started painted that and I painted this for a neighbor. And this. I started getting a little money and I was saving enough. I came home from a meeting one night. And then before you got a phone call from your brother, the lawyer. So oh God, somebody died. So I called him. I said, what's up? He says, some guy called me from Omaha, Nebraska, says he's your son. He's trying to find you. Remember that three-year-old kid I walked away from 20 years earlier? <laughs> what? Yeah. I'm, it's in your bar park, man. Here. He didn't believe I was sober or trying to get sober. He just knew what I was. He gave me the number. I call it, and it was my son, Chris. Guess what? He's in the program three years when he called me. Three years in recovery. He became an alcoholic himself. He wasn't even around me. He says, I talked to my sponsor, Dad, and he told me that I need to get in touch with you, and all I want to have is a relationship with my father. I hold no animosity towards you. I just want to have a relationship with my father. I said, how'd you find me? He said, Mom told me you were probably dead, but you had a brother who was an attorney, so I looked all the attorneys up in Pennsylvania until I found your brother. That's how he found me. So we started talking on the phone, and I started writing him. And then when I had a little money saved up from painting, I went out to Omaha, and he was married, had a grandchild, and I spent 10 days out there with him. You talking about a trip? I'm sober. I'm holding my grandson. I'm with my son. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to figure this out. I don't deserve all this. My sponsor told me, he says, God must think you're worth it or he wouldn't give it to you. So shut up. Don't question him. Just, just accept it as his gift to you. Because you didn't take a drink today, dummy. So I come back here to Cannonsburg, <coughs> and I'm getting weller, and I'm going to the surgeon, and every once a month I go down to Pittsburgh, and they want to check me out, and they're standing there like this. I go in the room one day, and there's a bunch of doctors around there, and they're going like this. You ain't supposed to be here. And I said, what do you mean? She wants to be dead. I said, oh, oh, sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with the liver. The liver's fine. The kidneys are fine. Everything's fine. How you breathing? Fine. <sighs> One lung. You know? They said, get out of here. You make us go back to medical school. And I haven't had a problem physically since. I weigh 190 pounds standing here today. I can afford these now because I paint now and I make pretty good money in it. I try to give back to what was so freely given me. I get a lot of calls through 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Some drunk wants to talk to me. I go, oh, God. I know my, my sponsor went through now. Standing there saying, you're boy, shit, man. I'm I know. I know. I know what I put my poor sponsor through. 
You know, and my son came out and he spent 10 days with me. Then he came out here a couple months ago and led for me. I chaired the meeting in my home group, and he was my lead. Tell me there ain't no God. Tell me. And when he spoke, I said, boy, that apple didn't far fall from the tree. Because <laughs> he looks like me, poor guy. <laughs> and, and my grandson, to, to have a relationship I do now, he's divorced because his wife was an addict. She went back to using it. She wouldn't get clean. He tried to work with her. She wouldn't do it, so he had to get out for the baby's sake. So he went to court, got total custody, and it's just him and the baby. Grandma helps, which is a blessing. She can't believe me. She doesn't believe this happened to me. But he wanted to meet his side of the family, my brothers and sisters. You know, they invited me home. I went to see my My brother's got a mansion. He's got 100 lawyers working for him now. He's got a law firm. He's got, he's got offices in Scranton, Wilkesboro, Scranton, Strasburg. He's got offices, 100 attorneys. <coughs> I go up there and I'm sitting by his pool. Wow, get this, a pool. <coughs> I'm sitting there like I'm somebody now. And I'm with my family and my sisters and my brothers and my nephews and nieces. They're calling me Uncle Floyd. God gave that back to me. But you know what I really look at? The miracle was you guys. Hey, hey. When I was sick and dying and he had pitted me to hell in the beginning, sitting there in those chairs, you loved me back to hell. That's what you did. You didn't care what I was. You didn't care I laid in the gutter, eating out of dumpsters, brushing maggots off of chicken bones and eating to survive. You didn't care about that. You loved me back. And that's what you did. AA did that for me. Put me in the cradle of its arms and loved me back to health and made me feel like I was worth something. I never thought I was worth anything. But you made me feel you're worth something, Floyd. And I never realized that. My brothers and sisters, uh, we have a ball now. I go up there now. I'm going up after the conference. I'm going up there to spend some time. And we have a ball. Me and my brothers go hiking. And we, we talk about this. And My brother told me one time, he heard me lead in my hometown. My brother, lawyer, sitting right there. He get up afterwards, tears in his eyes. He says, if I known it was that bad, you should have talked. I said, no. Nah. It happened exactly the way it was supposed to happen. Because if you had known and you tried to do any more than you already did, I would have abused you. I would have took everything you had, and today you'd hate me. It happened exactly the way it was supposed to happen. I had to suffer like that so I could get to where I am now. I'm one of them hard cases that had to walk through the valley of the shadow of death to get to the other end. I already ate my life. You guys love me back. And you haven't stopped. You keep getting around me and encouraging me and telling me when. And I sponsor guys. I sponsor guys. That, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I, got the, I can tell somebody else what to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's a gas right there. And they have them listen. <laughs> that's even a bigger one. You know, that's, that's my life in a nutshell. And, and God's grace is beyond measure. I'm not a holy roller, but you know what? I go to a church. I, I started going back to church. November, this November, I'm going to be ordained into a deaconship. I'm going to be a deacon in my church. Can you imagine that? A skid row bum like me going to be Deacon Floyd. <laughs> That's what they're going to go. And they're going to make me deacon of the youth. Everybody got an assignment. I'm going to be deacon to the youth. And there's 300 youth in my church. They're going to entrust their teenagers to this drunk. And, expect, and, I, and, I, and I let them know. The ones that I have problems, I, show, I tell them what's waiting for them. Let me tell you what's down there. Because I've already been there. I know what's there. That's about all I could want to share today. But I'd like to close my lead with this if you don't mind. Last night I dreamed I passed away and left this world behind. I started down that lonely road, my destiny to find. I came to the crossroads where a bright sign did tell, 
Turn left to heaven, my friend, or go right to hell. I didn't have to study long. I knew the path to take. So I started down that beaten road that leads to Satan's place. Satan met me at the gate. What's your name, my friend? I'm just Floyd, who came to a sad, sad end. Satan went through his files and said, You made a mistake, I fear. You're listed as an alcoholic. We don't want you here. So I went back to where I came, in that bright sign I did see, and I turned left to heaven, as happy as I could be. St. Peter was waiting at the gate, his files in his hand, and I knew it wouldn't be too long till I met the main, main man. Come, Floyd, my friend, for you I have a new birth. You're listed as an alcoholic. You've had your hell on earth. With a heart full of joy entered in, and what to my surprise to see, my old buddy Bill and Cliff, and a friend named Lee. There was Kathy Tanya in the rain, and a gal named Belle, and I wish you were happy. I thought they went to hell. You can learn something from my trip. You have a place in heaven if you try hard not to slip. If someone tempts you with a drink, when you're not feeling well, you just tell them, loved ones, you're going to heaven. You've already been to hell. Thank you.